Hello, everyone. We'll wait a couple minutes to see who else will log on, and then we'll get started. Good morning. How are you doing today? I am all right. How are you doing? You know, I'm, actually, I'm actually doing kind of good today. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. And if other people sign on, that is obviously fine. Um, so I just wanted to take uh, a couple minutes to give you all the opportunity, if you need to, to talk about the suicide on campus um, and or ask questions about suicide in general. As I said in my email the other day, um, we will talk about suicide in a couple weeks. We have a whole lecture about it, um, but I am definitely willing to give people a space and I'm not going to push this, right? If people don't feel comfortable talking, that's fine. Um, and then we'll just, you know, go on. But I just, I'll share briefly that I knew um, the students and uh, just feel profound sadness at the loss. Um, yeah, a lot of potential. And um, one thing is, you know, if you knew him, um, please don't blame yourself in any way because there's honestly not much you can do in general. And then when it gets to a certain point, there's nothing you can do. It's a, it's, it's a choice that a person makes that makes sense to them in that moment. So um, I have the chat open, or again, if you wanna unmute um, and say anything, how you're feeling or ask any questions, feel free. I'll give it a minute or two in case people take a sec to type. Um, if you uh, don't have anything to say, don't want to talk about it, um, after that minute or two, I'll start lecturing. Um, let's see, do you think that because of this university will bring more awareness to how strict we are with the COVID policy? Uh, I feel like he's not the only one who has been feeling like that. That's a really good question. Um, and it's certainly something many students have articulated to me is how isolating, um, you know, the social distancing can feel right now. 
I think the university is going to keep their strict protocols just because it's the reason why um, we've been able to stay open. Uh, you're going to see some Simba here. Um, but I hope that they make more support available and more activities um, and find more ways to do things in a socially distanced way, but they don't need to see it through nose. Um, I think that's a really good question. And I know that that's something that even I have felt, you know, especially since I can't be on campus yet, um, that it's very isolating, right? And it can be depressing. We're going to start talking about depression today. And some of you might recognize some of the symptoms in yourself. Um, this is actually one thing I didn't say at the beginning of class that I often say, but I think it's important to say as we start to talk about the disorders is um, there's something you can get called med student syndrome where you basically end up thinking you have every disorder we talk about. You probably don't, but you might also find you have symptoms of some things, right? And sometimes that can be helpful and bring good awareness. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're gonna relax protocols just because they do wanna keep campus open as much as they can, right? To have in-person classes. Um, but I know that they said that the event last Friday was just a starting place um, and that they are going to be having other events. I know we have not quite been at that place yet, but the psychology department um, does plan to have a virtual event for those who can't be there in person um, with the counseling staff as well. And actually, I am, if Simba will let me, um, he's just licking my hand that has the mouse on it right now. Um, I'm putting information about counseling services in the chat, um, just in case anybody does feel like they need to reach out. But my understanding from academic affairs and student affairs is that they really want to create a lot of support for you all because, you know, even if you didn't know this student, right? Um, it's still really hard to hear. Like when I wrote you that email on Friday morning, I was so sad and I didn't know who it was, right? And then I heard who it was and I knew that I knew him and I, to be perfectly honest, just hysterically cried for 10 minutes straight. Um, you know, and everyone grieves in their own way and everyone reacts in different ways and that's totally fine. But even just the act of, you know, losing a Marlin, right? is really difficult because we're such a small tight knit community. So yeah, some of they don't need a bunch of threes in the chat. So uh, he also, <laughs> and some of you who have animals might notice this, they can tell when you're upset and he has been very good at like whenever I'm talking about it, finding me. Um, so, you know, if you have pets um, that you're able to hang out with, definitely give yourself time to do that. Certainly support each other, find ways, you know, I know it hasn't been warm. It's supposed to be a little warmer today, but it's been sunny a lot of the days, right? So find ways you can sit outside with friends and socialize that way if you're bundled up, um, just to get that connection. Um, because I think that's a big piece of what everyone is struggling right now. And I don't know the story of what the student in particular was going through last week. So I can't say this exactly was it for him, um, but certainly it's, it's a struggle for all of us, right? It's really tough not to be able to see friends and even family in some cases. So um, yeah, find ways to make those connections. Um, you know, and even if it's just, you know, one or two of your closest friends and you sit six feet apart, you know, by the volleyball courts or something, um, then at least you, again, have that support. Um, or if you, you know, FaceTime with them or actually what I've started doing with some of my friends is just old fashioned calling. Like I haven't spent so much time on the phone <laughs> since probably I was in high school, um, but my eyes get tired from all the Zoom. Right, so it's actually been really nice just to talk to somebody. So recommend that as well. Does anyone else have other questions or comments? Anything you want to say or ask? And again, I don't want to push, but I just want to give you space if you need it. And this certainly isn't the end of this conversation. Like I said, we will talk explicitly about suicide in a couple weeks. Um, so we will, you know, be blunt about it, but also empathetic. Um, so one of the things I think I mentioned in my email is that I am a 
uh, survivor of someone in my life committing suicide. It was actually one of our ministers. Um, and I learned a lot from that experience. And one of the things I learned in addition to, you can't blame yourself for anything, um, is that it is so important to name what this is, right? To not use euphemisms like, oh, this person is just gone, right? Like this person, uh, some people prefer the language died by suicide. I say committed suicide, uh, ended his life, right? Um, and it's important to say that because unfortunately suicide can be contagious if you don't do that and you don't name it and you don't show how much it affects the person, people around them. So that's why I'm giving this space and why I'm gonna be pretty blunt about it. I think that um, not everyone is gonna process it in this way um, and, and might use euphemisms and, you know, again, well-intentioned people I was talking to are saying things like, well, you know, the counseling staff, they can just deal with it. And I'm like, let's use different language perhaps, right? Um, but, you know, I have six years of training that equipped me to talk about these things and the vast majority of people don't, right? So um, just putting that out there, again, clearly not closing the door, please reach out to me if you wanna talk individually or again, in the chat is the information for counseling services. If you personally feel like, uh, you know, again, even if you didn't know him, if this is bringing stuff up for you. Um, the other thing is I do fully apologize, but I did not get your exams graded this weekend because I did no work this weekend because I was just grading um, because I did know the students. So I hope that you all will understand and know that as soon as my head is back on uh, correctly, I will get that done for you. So thank you in advance. Okay, so today we're going to start talking about mood disorders. Um, and again, I don't know this student's story fully. I don't know if he had been struggling with depression. It's not uncommon for people with suicide to have depression, but certainly it's not required. And in fact, sometimes people who commit suicide, um, they don't have any mental health problems. So, uh, you know, we don't want to make any assumptions, but I know you know, for people who have a history of depression themselves, this might bring some stuff up, right? And um, I just know that I am, as always, trying to be respectful as we talk about these things, but then also um, try to be as scientific as I can as well, give you as much factual information as possible. So for the rest of the semester, you know, that we have the background information under our belts, we're going to focus on the individual disorders and we won't get to all of them in the DSM. And in fact, um, we're in the process of changing the name of this particular course. Uh, so abnormal, right, is definitely stigmatizing. And, you know, we talked about how, who gets to find what's abnormal and things like that. Uh, so we're going to go with the convention that a lot of schools are using now, which would be to call this class adult psychopathology. That's what it's often called at the graduate school level. Uh, and it describes more accurately what it's about. Uh, and that also opens the door in the future for us to offer a child psychopathology class, which I know Dr. Margarel would love to do. Um, so that's our hope that we'll be able to do that in the future as well. So um, we will talk about the major disorders that we see in adults. And then in some of your presentations, we're going to see beyond that, right? Um, so I'm looking forward to those at the end of the semester. And if you have uh, people have been emailing me questions, I haven't been great with my email since Friday. Um, today, I'm going to try to get back into it. Um, so certainly email me questions about anything going on. Um, so really interestingly, before 2013, before the DSM-5 revision, uh, the mood disorders were all lumped under one category in the DSM. In the DSM-5, uh, there are actually two separate categories. There's one for depressive disorders and there's one for bipolar and related disorders. So there's a recognition that these things are distinct enough that they should each have their own category. Um, other things we'll run into uh, when we talk about anxiety disorders in a few weeks, you'll see that there are other splits there as well, where there's again starting to be a recognition that Maybe some disorders are distinct enough that they can 
Okay, so we're going to start with just a general overview of the mood disorders. And so what makes mood disorders abnormal or pathological, if we're going to use that language? It's important to really distinguish between mood and mood disorder. Um, so mood is essentially just your affective state. Uh, an affect here with an A <laughs> uh, essentially means emotions, okay? So this is a term you'll hear used in psychology as a noun. Your affect is whatever uh, today. Um, affect tends to be relatively long, stable states, uh, and these are characterized by, you know, distinct emotions. And moods can be positive, they can be negative, they can be kind of neutral as well, right? We all have days where someone asks how you do and you're just like, meh, right? And that's perfectly normal. A mood disorder, something that would fall into either the depressive disorders or the bipolar disorders category is characterized by extremely low or high moods. Um, and it's also important to make a distinction between normal and clinical mood disturbance. However, as this cartoon in the corner points out, some people just feel kind of down at the start of the week, right? Um, or it's also perfectly natural to experience depressed moods or symptoms like it if you're grieving a loss, for example. Um, but clinical mood disturbance, what we would diagnose with one of these disorders, is characterized by symptoms that are more severe, uh, have more numerous symptoms, and are of longer duration. And the biggest thing, the biggest distinction, is that it interferes with an individual's day-to-day -day functioning. So it interferes with an individual's day-to-day -day functioning. We're going to see this fairly consistently throughout each of the disorders we talk about that we're going to see that it has an impact on that person's day to day functioning on their ability to socialize do work for school or their place of employment. Things along those lines, so that's the real distinction of like meeting criteria for most disorders. There are a couple exceptions where the person doesn't have to be disturbed by it. For example, pedophilia, we don't care if they're disturbed by it, right? We know what problems it causes. Um, and so you can be diagnosed without it disrupting your own life. But we don't want to over pathologize, right? We don't want to, uh, you know, take someone who's had, you know, a bad week or a couple bad weeks and say, oh, you have this disorder, right? When they've been functioning perfectly well uh, in all aspects of their life, they're just feeling kind of sad, right? So that's a really important distinction. All right, so depression. And the interesting thing about the mood disorders is the way you diagnose them is by the current or historical presence of uh, one or more mood episodes, okay? So before we talk about the disorders themselves, we're going to define these types of episodes and what they look like. So um, depression in and of itself is a low sad state in which life seems dark and its challenges can seem overwhelming. Um, so a low sad state in which life seems dark and its challenges overwhelming. So a major depressive episode, and this again is something uh, that we'll see throughout the semester is that you, um, you need to have X number of symptoms to meet criteria for something. Um, and then so in some cases it will be like this, five out of nine. In other cases it might be three out of nine, right? It just depends on the disorder and what's been agreed upon. The DSM is essentially decided on by consensus of experts in that area. So it's not perfect, right? Um, and certainly we talked about some of the criticisms of it, um, but that is what you'll see distinctly here. And so just from my own experience, it's really common to treat people with depression because depression 
is the most commonly experienced psychological disorder. Um, so typically if someone is severely depressed, they are going to uh, report all nine of these to at least some extent. Um, but you can be diagnosed with only five. So that's really important. Now, one of those five has to either be the first one or the second one. So the first one is depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day. And this can either be your own subjective report of what you're feeling or observation by others. Um, because sometimes people have a hard time naming their emotions. In kids and adolescents, this can manifest as irritable mood because they don't have the words to articulate how they're feeling, even more so than adults, right? Um, and so it can just come off as like sort of being annoyed with everybody. The other one, if you don't have depressed mood, is diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities, uh, most of the day, nearly every day. This has a technical name. I'm going to put it in the chat for you. It's called anhedonia. And it's just loss of pleasure or interest. Um, so let's say you play a sport and usually you really enjoy doing it. If you were depressed, it might be like you don't even feel like going to practice. Once you're there, you're not super motivated or you might again just stay in bed. Even if you're there and you're doing it, you're just not getting the same joy out of it. You typically would. Now you can either have a decrease in appetite or an increase in appetite. And it can be with significant weight loss when not dieting or with weight gain, um, but you don't actually have to really meet that criteria. It's just a change from what was there before. And so people might kind of wonder why could it be both, right? Well, different people act in different ways and react in different ways. And I like to use myself as an example. So typically, I think like a lot of us, I'm a stress eater. So, you know, I got something big coming up. I might, you know, reach for those salty snacks or, you know, I have a whole bunch of Girl Scout cookies in my cupboard, which is both a good and bad thing right now, right? Um, and that's fine. But when I get past a threshold uh, of where I'm really stressed out, so I flash back to uh, when I thought I was going to be a veterinarian and I was taking organic chemistry and nothing against people who are excellent at chemistry. I just was not. Um, I couldn't eat when I was studying for the final because I was so worried. So it can be both versions of it. In kids or adolescents, it can be a failure to meet expected weight gain. Uh, so that can be a piece of this as well. Insomnia is inability to fall asleep or stay asleep. So it can be tossing and turning when you're trying to fall asleep. It can be waking up in the middle of the night and it taking a while for you to get back to sleep. Or it can be waking up too early in the morning and being unable to get back to sleep. Okay, so those uh, can happen, but then it can also go the other way where you have hypersomnia and you just sleep all the time. Um, I actually know someone who in college, um, thought they had mono. <laughs> that was a thing that went around a lot when I was in college and um, went to their doctor, tested negative for mono and their doctor, they were like, you know, I'm just sleeping all the time and I wake up, I'm so tired. And their doctor said like, could you be depressed? Right. And like, it took a minute for that person to process, right? Because we don't always think of physical symptoms being part of a psychological disorder, but that certainly can happen. There's either psychomotor agitation or retardation every, nearly every day. Um, and this has to be observable by others and not just subjective feelings. Um, so psychomotor agitation is more psychomotor movement than usual. So um, it could be, uh, you know, like jittery or bouncing your leg up and down because you're anxious. Again, I saw a lot of clients who struggled with depression when I was seeing clients none of the ones I ever saw had the agitation. They all had the psychomotor retardation. And this is not um, the way we used to refer to developmental delays. What this is, is like in music, when you see a retard in music, it means to slow down. Same thing here. This is a slowing of 
your psychomotor movements. So people who are depressed often move really slowly. They talk really slowly. They may have very flat affect, so their voice doesn't really go up and down when they talk. And it can almost feel like it's difficult for them to get the words out. Um, so that's pretty common to see in someone with depression. Fatigue or loss of energy. And again, nearly every day. Obviously that can go hand in hand with some of the sleep issues. Um, feelings of worthlessness or guilt. Uh, so excessive or inappropriate guilt. And the guilt can be to the point where you're delusional, where you think something that could never be your fault is your fault, right? So, you know, someone who's super depressed and has delusional guilt might think like they are solely responsible for the pandemic or something like that, right? Um, this was really shocking to me. Um, it takes you aback when I would do interviews with people with depression, um, the way that the skid tells you to ask this question is, uh, how have you been feeling about yourself? So there's no prompt to try to get them to say any particular word. And a lot of folks I would see, I would say a third to a half would spontaneously say worthless. So this is a very common experience for folks who experience depression. Then there is diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day. And this can be subjective or observable by others. Um, it's just, it takes them longer to make decisions. It takes them longer to remember things. And depression can be very similar to ADHD or a learning disorder in terms of the amount of time it takes someone to process something and you know, say put an answer on an exam. Uh, recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal ideation, or suicide attempt, or specific plan. So again, not every person with depression will feel this way. Not every person who dies by suicide was depressed. Uh, obviously, though, if this is a symptom that you have in that person, this is the first thing you address. So what you try to do is what's called a contract for safety, essentially saying that person has things they can do between now and the next time they'll see you if they're feeling depressed, um, if they're feeling suicidal. If you don't feel like that person can agree to that, or if they just say, I can't agree to that, you can involuntarily hospitalize them. Um, this is one of the few times when we might use that when someone is a threat to themselves or other people. Um, so, you know, again, that's a decision you have to make. And uh, sometimes clients will voluntarily go and say, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea for me to be someplace someone could watch me 24 hours a day right now. All right, so that is a major depressive episode. Again, you only need five of those. People who come in with severe depression tend to have most, if not all, nine. All right, so mania. Mania is the opposite of depression. Uh, it's a state of breathless euphoria or at least frenzied energy, uh, which people may have exaggerated beliefs that the world is theirs for the taking. Um, so again, like depression, this can get to the point of delusional, um, but it doesn't have to. So um, a manic episode, just like a depressive episode, is when you have these feelings for a period of a certain time. I don't think, actually, now that I think about it, I said on the depressive episode slide, but depressive episodes have to last two weeks to be diagnosable. Uh, manic episodes only have to last one. And there's some other caveats we'll talk about as well with manic episodes. So depression, depressive episodes, two weeks. Manic episodes, one week. Um, and a manic episode consists of a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, and abnormally and persistently increased goal-directed activity or energy lasting at least one week and present most of the day, nearly every day. So it's not just like 
they felt really good after they did well, you know, on something. It's like, it lasts for a week. So um, there is also a change with the DSM-5, um, which I realized I could be like, this changed as if it just happened and it was 2013. Uh, but I learned it all the other way. So <laughs> to me, it still seems new. Um, but one of the things they changed for the DSM-5 with a manic episode is if you have to be hospitalized because of your manic episode, it doesn't matter whether it's lasted a week or not. They count it as a manic episode. And you might be like, why would you have to be hospitalized if you just felt really good about yourself? Well, just like people with depression, people with mania can potentially be a threat to themselves or others, right? So sometimes they are not um, taking care uh, to, you know, not drink a drive, for example, or uh, they're spending all their money and putting themselves near bankruptcy, things along those lines. Um, oh, geez, sorry. Wow, that was trippy. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to set up my uh, video because I'm going to show one in a couple minutes and I should have just paused rather than try to talk at the same time. All right, let me reshare the screen. I mean, I talk fast, but not that fast, so. All right, there we go. Um, so a manic episode, again, one week or hospitalization, and you need three or more of the symptoms. So, um, oh, and interestingly, confusingly, <laughs> again, here mood can be either elevated and expansive or mood can be irritable, just like depression can be irritable, right? For depression, we only look at it that way with, uh, again, kids and adolescents. For adults, it can be this way for mania. So that's one of the... So if there is a manic episode um, and it has irritable mood, then you need four of these. But if it's the elevated mood, you only need three additional symptoms. So that is that. Um, so self-inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. So you just think you are the ish, uh, nothing can touch you. You are the best person in the world. Anything you come up with will immediately go really well because again, you are the ish. And so people will come up with like crazy entrepreneurial plans and things along those lines. And again, don't pull their money into it. Um, those of you who may have looked ahead to John's case, uh, you'll see he experiences some of these symptoms. Um, so they also experience a decreased need for sleep. They just feel they don't need to sleep. Um, then they are more talkative than usual, or they feel a pressure to keep talking. Uh, and part of that is related to they're racing thoughts. Essentially, they're trying to keep up with their thoughts. Oh, good question, Carla. I just saw your question in the chat. Is this similar to a panic attack or no? No, this is completely different. So in a panic attack, you actually feel like you're going to die. It's really terrifying. When you're manic, you feel like you're on top of the world. Well, that's a really, really good question. It is different, um, but similar in terms of being distinctly different from your normal functioning, if that makes sense. Good question. Um, so you can also have, uh, again, these subjective experience of your thoughts racing or what they call flight of ideas. So it's just like, you have this idea and then you have that idea and then you have this idea and none of them are related. Um, let me see, distractibility. What an ironic one for me to be distracted and not be able to find, huh? Um, and this can either be self-reported or observed by other people. An increase in goal-directed activity, and that can be socially, that can be at work, at school, it can be sexually, or you could have that psychomotor agitation we talked about as a piece of that. So they're just doing, 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 doing things all the time. Uh, you also might have excessive involvement in activities that have the potential for painful consequences. So these are things like spending sprees, so again, spending all your money, 
yeah, that's not physically harming you in the moment, right? But it's certainly going to have negative consequences for you down the road. Um, you might be engaging in sexual indiscretions. Again, problematic if you're in a relationship um, and you're out there sleeping around. Also, these folks tend to have unprotected sex, which puts them at risk for STIs, right? Um, foolish business, business investments and even things that are more dangerous that can be dangerous to themselves and others physically, like drinking, using drugs, and again, driving or operating other machinery while under the influence. Yeah, grandiosity, great question, Madison. Um, so grandiosity is just feeling like you are the best in the world, um, that you just have the best self-esteem ever, and no one can touch you. So it's possible within mania to get um, like psychotic symptoms with it. And people who would be psychotic with the grandiosity would literally believe they're the second coming of Christ or they're Napoleon or someone else from history, right? Um, so it's essentially just thinking you're untouchable, thinking like you're the best person around um, and that like nothing can hurt you. As you can imagine, that goes into some of these other things like engaging in these activities that have the potential for painful consequences because you don't think that they will affect you? Really good question. Hopefully that was a helpful clarification. All right, there's also what you call a hypomanic episode. Uh, and so this is essentially a manic episode that's not as severe and lasts a shorter duration. So four days, instead of a week and it has to be abnormal and different from your normal experience um, and persistently again elevated expansive or irritable mood and that increased goal directed activity or energy um, and present most of the day nearly every day all the other symptoms are identical it's just it's a shorter duration the biggest thing is that because this isn't as severe as a manic episode, it has to be associated with an unequivocal change in functioning uh, from when you don't have, or when you're not experiencing mania, or in this case, hypomania. Um, so it's something that's uncharacteristic of you when you're not symptomatic. And that change is observable by other people but it's not severe enough to cause marked impairment or hospitalization. If you have to be hospitalized during what could be construed as a hypomanic episode, it immediately becomes a manic episode because it's obviously negatively interfering with your life. So essentially these are low grade manic episodes, uh, tend not to be quite as dangerous, but certainly they can. Um, and what we'll see as we go through the rest of the chapter talking about this is these make a difference as to the type of diagnosis someone will get. All right, so in terms of the mood disorders, we have major depression and persistent depressive disorder. Um, so major depressive disorder sometimes is referred to as unipolar depression. Um, it's what we commonly think of when we think of clinical depression. And then persistent depressive disorder, which used to be called dysthymia, is still sort of colloquially addressed that way sometimes, is a more long lasting, less severe depression. So it's lower grade depression that goes on for a really long time. Bipolar disorders, once upon a time, these were known as manic depression. Uh, so you may have heard that term, um, but we don't use it anymore. So you have bipolar one disorder, and bipolar one has episodes of full mania, so either seven days or you have to be hospitalized for it, and episodes of depression. Bipolar two includes episodes of hypomania and depression. So if you've never had a manic episode, but you've got hypomanic episodes, you would be diagnosed bipolar two. And then there's something called cyclothymic disorder which is sort of a low-grade bipolar disorder. It's hypomanic episodes and 
periods of depression that don't meet full criteria for a depressive episode. So it's you get the mood cycling, but uh, they never meet the full criteria of a manic or a depressive episode. But still obviously interfering with your life. All right, so this chart I think is really helpful. Um, so this kind of tells you how you decide what to diagnose someone with if they're coming in with this. So if we'll talk about depression first. So we have depression over here and then we have mania on top. So if they're coming in with a episodic moderate to severe, so this is something that's been going on for like two weeks, maybe three weeks. Uh, and it is a lot of those symptoms um, and they've not had any hypomanic or manic episodes, then they'd be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And again, some people call that unipolar depression. If they're having, again, an episodic to severe depressive episode either currently or in the past, and they've experienced a manic episode or are currently experiencing one, they'd be diagnosed bipolar one. If they've had, again, those depressive episodes, and again, they're currently or in the past have experienced hypomanic episodes, they'd be diagnosed bipolar two. If the depression is instead chronic, milder, um, and we have no mania at all, that would be persistent depressive disorder. If we do have hypomanic episodes, then it's cyclothymic disorder. So again, I find this chart really helpful to sort of think about which types of mood episodes lead to which disorder being diagnosed in combination. So that's, I think, sort of helpful. All right, so now we are gonna talk about depression and I do have a clip to play. Um, so I am going to hopefully get the CD player to or DVD player to talk to my computer. Most of the time it does, but not always. Um, and so, uh, you know, depressive disorders are, again, that feeling down and it's extreme, it's overwhelming. It can feel like life changing. Um, and, you know, the sort of quintessential uh, portrayal, <laughs> I guess, in literature, if you want to call it that, is uh, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. So uh, he, you know, is just always down. He has psychomotor. He talks really slowly. Sorry, that is in the background you're hearing uh, this starting off. So um, the good news is it is working. Um, let me just start the clip and then pause. There we go. Because uh, I'm going to show that in just a minute. But the idea that, you know, you have to sort of drag yourself around and you kind of see the pessimistic sign of life. This is a fairly accurate representation of what it's like to be someone with depression. And the one thing I really like about A.A. A. Milne's depiction of Eeyore is that Eeyore still has friends, right? Uh, there are still, the animals still want to spend some time with him um, and he's not ostracized for having a mental illness. So I think that that's really great. Um, so I am going to do a new share now um, and share the uh, DVD player over here. Um, and I'm going to show you a clip from the movie Swingers um, that's going to show what it might be like to be someone who experiences a depressive episode. Okay. Hey, this is Mike. Leave a message after the beep. Hey, Mikey, it's Trent. You home? You there? We're going to play uh, hockey at Sue's house until 1030, and then we're either going to the uh, Lava Lounge for Sinatra night, or we'll be at the uh, Derby for a Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. And we might also check out a uh, swing night at the El Rey. And if we're not there, we'll be at the uh, Three of Clubs. All right? Otherwise, we'll be at the Dresden Room, man. So uh, come on out. Meet up with us. See you soon, gorgeous.
this is Mike. Leave a message after the beep. Mike, it's Rob. I'm downstairs. Come on, pick it up and buzz me in, buddy. Come on, it's up. Yesterday? You haven't been drinking, have you? a lot of the symptoms of depression there, right? You can see um, that he hasn't been eating. He's not really taking care of himself. Um, he, you know, probably hasn't been sleeping. He's just sort of sitting in the dark. Um, and so those become a, a big part of what life is like for someone with depression. It's not always obviously that dramatic, but a lot of times they just want to you know, kind of stay away from everybody else and, um, you know, just experience that uh, as it is happening and feeling for them. Um, you know, and again, uh, in this case, his friend comes and to take care of him, right? But uh, certainly sometimes they have to force themselves to do things. Um, and even basic hygiene stuff, so I had a very depressed client I saw while I was on residency and she only showered once a week and she told me it was just because it felt so exhausting to her to do. Um, and again, something that we typically think of as pretty common, like, you know, not every day perhaps, but you know, most of the time or if you play a sport, maybe even more than once a day, uh, it was just exhausting for her, right? You can see that sort of physical component of depression as well. Uh, in terms of statistics, it's very prevalent, as I mentioned. You're very likely to see this if you go into any of the helping professions. Uh, so one in 10 people in the US at any given time is suffering from any mood disorder, be it bipolar or depression. Um, and depression has a lifetime prevalence of 16.1%. Uh, it's lower around 12% for men, but as high as 25% for women at the end of this lecture, which we'll either get to on Thursday or next week, we talk about some of the reasons for that. Um, dysthymia or that persistent depressive disorder has a lifetime prevalence of about 3.6%. And in contrast, uh, bipolar disorder is much less common. It's only 1.3%. And that is all sort of a theme we'll see throughout the semester that sort of the more dramatic disorders, things like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, those all don't occur as often as um, some of the ones we're more used to, like depression and anxiety. So how do you get diagnosed with major dep depressive disorder? You need to have had at least one major depressive episode either in the past or currently, and never have had a manic or a hypomanic episode. If you've had one of those, you immediately are bumped to a bipolar diagnosis. And then again, significant distress or impairment is that phrase we'll see over and over and over throughout this semester. So. Um, significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So you certainly saw it with the guy in the video clip, right? He's not feeding himself. Um, he's not uh, 
sleeping, probably. <laughs> if he has a job, he's not going to it. Uh, so you can see how much this is interfering with his life, right? Now, to be diagnosed with persistent depressive disorder, you have depressed mood for at least two years. And again, never to the point that you have a full-blown depressive episode per se, uh, but it's just kind of always there. Um, so you have depressed mood most of the day, more days than not, for at least two years. And this can be either by the person's own account, the so subjective account, or by observation by others. Then you need two or more of these symptoms. So again, if remember we talked about a depressive mood episode, you need five of nine, right? Here you only need two of these symptoms. Poor appetite or overeating. So we're not even to the point, right, of loss of appetite or increased appetite, right? It's, it's a lower grade. Insomnia or hypersomnia, low energy or fatigue, low self-esteem rather than those feelings of worthlessness, poor concentration or difficulty making decisions, and feelings of hopelessness rather than thoughts of death. So again, sort of lower grade, um, not as severe in your symptom presentation. And you've never been without symptoms of depression for a period of two months at a time over the course of those two years. And you've never had a manic or a hypomanic episode. Again, if you had a manic episode, that would bump you into bipolar disorder. If you've had a hypomanic episode, that would put you into psychothymia. And you're still going to experience that significant distress or impairment in order to, you know, be qualified for a diagnosis. Again, we don't want to just go around willy nilly labeling every person who's feeling sad as having depression, right? So we want to make sure there are distinctions here. You can experience both pervasive depressive disorder, PDD on this slide, and major depressive episodes. And this is sort of, it's not its own diagnosis, but it's sort of colloquially called uh, double depression. So they have dyslimic disorder, but then, or pervasive de depressive disorder, persistence, there we go. <laughs> And then they have major depressive episodes occasionally as well. So they could be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. So uh, the uh, dysthymia or the persistent depressive uh, disorder usually develops first. And uh, this is actually fairly common and it's associated with more severe depression, more severe psychopathology and with problematic future course, which means it's harder to treat people who have double depression. So we're gonna talk about the symptoms of depression and how they affect different parts of your life. And each of these is gonna have its own slide. So we'll start with emotional symptoms. So depressed mood, they feel gloomy, they feel dejected, they feel despondent. There's a dislike of yourself, that anhedonia, that loss of pleasure in things, loss of mirth experience or joy or positive emotions. Really interesting. Some of the research that's being done with the MMPI is showing that this, this loss of mirth experience and loss of pleasure may be the most distinct features of depression, actually. So um, the what used to be called the depression scale on the MMPI-2 is now called uh, low positive emotionality. Uh, and it really is about this loss of your ability to experience joy. And actually, since I'm talking about the MMPI, I didn't have this upstairs with me when I was teaching about this uh, the other day. So I wanted to just show you all briefly what some of the MMPI stuff looks like. So this is what the questions actually look like just a whole bunch of questions. And then you would have a form that had true false on it. Um, I don't have any of the forms because I'm never gonna actually give it. So I got the more durable version instead. Um, and then there's just a technical manual for it. It's pretty thick. 
Um, and this has all the information uh, that you might want to know about how they did their research, about data for different populations. Um, and then this is the most helpful one. They started doing this with the MPI 2RF. This is a manual that is for administration scoring and interpretation. Um, so it has all kinds of really helpful information in here. So for example, let me flip to the page about that uh, scale we were just talking about. Got to find it real quick there. So the low positive emotion scale uh, is called RC2. Um, so if people uh, score highly on this, they present with anhedonia. Hey, we just talked about that. They're pessimistic, socially introverted, uh, socially disengaged, uh, lack of interest in things, lack energy, and they'll have those physical symptoms of depression. And then the really cool thing in this manual is there are also diagnostic considerations and there are treatment considerations. So it tells you here are the things you should think about diagnosing this person with, do more uh, you know, assessment to figure it out. Uh, but it says, you know, possibly major depression. And then in terms of treatment considerations, it says, you know, evaluate the need for antidepressant medication. Uh, if it's significant depression may require inpatient treatment. Uh, significant lack of positive emotions may interfere with their ability to engage in treatment. And a focus on anhedonia should be something as you target for intervention. And in fact, uh, the cognitive behavioral treatment for depression, which is one of the things we'll talk about when we talk about treatments, specifically starts by targeting that anhedonia, talking that lack of joy experience, the lack of engaging in activities you enjoy. So big, big thing here is this loss of pleasure or loss of mirth. They just feel miserable, empty, humiliated. Again, it doesn't always have to look like sadness. It could be anger, anxiety, agitation. It can have crying spells. Um, one of my depressed clients I remember was like a very high functioning uh, sort of go get them type person and just was overwhelmed. They were like, I don't know why I'm just crying out of the blue, right? It just didn't compete with what they were used to from their go-getter personality. And then emptiness, they can just feel nothing sometimes. In terms of motivational symptoms, uh, these will be described as paralysis of the will. There's no drive. They don't want to do their usual activities. They have to force themselves to do everyday things, as I mentioned, like showering, like eating, as we saw in the video clip. They have that sense of helplessness and hopelessness, wishes for escape. And you can see this sometimes in just like sleeping all the time. Sometimes they'll try to self-medicate with drugs or alcohol. Um, sometimes they'll be stress eating or binge eating and purging, or sometimes they'll engage in self-harm behavior. And sometimes it's just, they're not doing anything but watching Netflix, right? Like we all have those days, but when that goes on for two weeks and it's getting in the way of like your school or your work, right? That you should start to work, right? They have increased wishes for dependency. They want other people to make decisions for them. They want other people to help care for them. And then again, suicidality can be a piece of this. And we'll talk about this in more detail next week. Uh, more than a quarter of people with depression do attempt suicide, and 6 to 15% of people with depression commit suicide. Uh, but again, you don't have to be depressed to be suicidal. I want to make that clear. Behavioral symptoms, inertia, they're less active. They stay in bed. They're spending time alone. They live small. They don't want to go out and do things. So their world is kind of like, uh, you know, our COVID world a little bit if we weren't able to like mask up and go out a little bit, right? So going on to retardation again, moving and speaking more slowly. Uh, again, can go in that agitation direction, but that's more rare. Lack of productivity, they're just not getting done what they would typically get done. And quietness, sometimes they're just, they just don't talk that much. Now, in terms of cognitive symptoms, cognition here is um, 
your ability to think, you know, uh, memory, attention, things along those lines. Uh, so they do have this negative self image. They see them adequate, undesirable, inferior, or even evil, particularly again, if they're getting into that delusional version of depression. Negative expectations include pessimism. There's a tendency to blame themselves for things that are not their fault. And also they don't credit themselves for positive achievements. So they get a really good score on a test, say, and they're like, I got lucky, right? Not crediting all the work they did going into study and prepare for that test and taking it while depressed, right? Um, so that's a big piece of it as well. Indecisiveness, it's really hard for them to make decisions. Every decision feels like... And then... Hello? Okay, I think we're good. Um, so uh, pseudo dementia, so it's not like they have Alzheimer's or something like that, but it can feel like similar symptoms. So they can feel confused, have trouble remembering things, be very easily distracted and unable to solve the smallest problems. So in older adults, before you sort of knee jerk diagnose someone with the dementia, you really do need to screen for depression because um, it's entirely possible that what they are experiencing is a depressive episode and it's manifesting with similar symptoms. Now, in terms of physical or in somatic symptoms, um, they have a loss or increased appetite easily fatigued. One of the things that's not a diagnostic criteria, but is really important is loss of libido. Like I mentioned this when I talked about the Brecht depression inventory, right? This could affect your relationship negatively. This can, you know, just make you feel not like yourself, essentially. And this, uh, side note, this has to be a distinct change, right? So someone who was asexual or aromantic would automatically right, be like, oh, they're depressed. That's why um, this is a, a change from your normal orientation and your normal sex drive. Again, insomnia or hypersomnia or some combination of the two. And then somatic ailment. Somatic just means it's stress related. So it might not be entirely caused by psychological things, but it's at least partially stress related. So headaches, indigestion, constipation, dizzy spells, general aches and pains, and it can lead to a preoccupation with those where they kind of become obsessed with like, what's wrong with me physically. Then there's the interpersonal symptoms, conflict and annoyance. Um, so they will get into fights with people or just other people will become annoyed with them partially because of their dependence. Right, so they want other people to help them. And it's such a distinct change typically from what they're usually like that the other people are just like, why, why can't you just do this yourself? Why don't you just get up and come out with us, right? And so if you have a not psychologically minded person or, you know, just someone who you haven't shared that this is why you're not doing it, right? They might become annoyed with you. Um, it can be selfishness unintentionally just because they're so overwhelmed they can't look beyond themselves. It's like if anyone here has ever had the flu really badly or I know a couple of you that I've talked to have had COVID. Um, it's not that you're being selfish by not like helping other people. It's like you literally can't do anything but focus on trying to get better or just sleeping, right? Depression is like that. And that's one thing I really want to impress on all of you throughout this course is that mental illness is the equivalent of physical illness. You can't just tell someone, oh, feel better, right, when they have asthma. <laughs> um, you know, just breathe some air, right, in the middle of an asthma attack. No, they need their inhaler. People with depression need, you know, therapy and or medications, right, in order to feel better. They can't just will it away. They can't just like walk into nature and make it go away. There's a lot of stigma around getting therapy, taking medications, and there really shouldn't be because it is the same as if, again, 
you had a physiological problem and you are treating it. So there should be no shame. We should be applauding people for taking care of it. Sensitivity in vicious circles. So kind of going with the conflict and annoyance. So they'll be very oversensitive to any sort of criticism, even if it's not intentional. Um, and they can be really hard to be around. It's hard to be around a friend you're used to being pretty energetic and upbeat. Right, and so then that can lead to people not wanting to spend time with you and then you feel even more isolated. All right, so the next thing we're gonna start talking about uh, is the causes of depression um, or the etiology is the fancy word we use for that. Um, and this is uh, generally divided into two categories, um, but as you'll see, there are different subcategories within each. So what we do for each disorder is we sort of think about our model section uh, that we covered before the exam, and then we apply it to the individual disorder. So in this case, we look at things like genetic, biochemical, uh, neurophysiological, and biological rhythms for biological causes. And then for psychological things, we look at stressful life events, vulnerabilities, and then explanations based on the theories that, again, came up in our model chapter, like psychodynamic, behavioral, cognitive, and sociocultural. So genetics, we've known since the time of um, uh, the ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, that there is probably a genetic component. They notice that these things run in families in particular. So there's a couple different ways we study this um, to try to figure out the genetic components. So one is what's called a family pedigree study. And to do this, you select probands, and a proband is the person with the trait you're studying. So in this particular case, it would be the person with depression, right? And so then you'd look for other people within the family that also had diagnosable depression, for example. So that person, your identified patient, your proband is uh, the focus of the genetic study. And so if depression is inherited, then you should see higher rates of it in family members of that proband. And in fact, that is what we find. So again, somewhere between 10 to 15% of the general population has depression, but as many as 20% of relatives are depressed. So there's a slightly higher risk if we look at it that way. Probably the most common ways we try to look at genetic things are twin studies because it gives us a really nice opportunity to look at people who have supposedly shared a womb, right? Shared a uh, environment um, so that we can try to control for a bunch of things. So we look at the difference between monozygotic or MZ, identical twins. They're called that because they come from one zygote, one sperm, meaning one egg. And at some point in the early zygotic process, uh, instead of just dividing and becoming one person, they become two fetuses, I think, becomes next. Embryos, zygote embryo fetus, there we go. So they become two embryos, okay? So monozygotic twins are essentially identical genetically. Dizygotic twins or DZ twins or fraternal twins come from two different sperms meeting up with two different eggs. So they are no more genetically similar than any other set of siblings. The only difference is, again, they shared a uterus, they share an environment growing up. So uh, it can be really helpful to look at, is it actually in our genes? Because we can compare, again, people who came from the same egg versus people who had two different eggs in the same uterus, right? And so what do we tend to find? So one study found that uh, if one twin has it, so that's what we tend to look at. If one twin has it, does the other twin have it? So if one MZ twin, identical twin had it, 40% chance that their twin would also have it. 
So 40% of the identical twin pairs, they both had depression. For another study, uh, oh, sorry, and then the DZ twins were only 11%. So that's, you know, not great. That's sort of around the general population. Another study found 46% for the identical twins, 20% for the fraternal twins, the MZ versus the DZ. So Sullivan and all are on here because what they did is they did a quantitative review of twin studies. So what you do when you do this is you combine the data from all the previous studies, essentially. So they ended up with 21,000 twins studied in this, uh, this final data set. And what they found is MZ twins, identical twins, are twice as likely to both develop depression than DZ twins, the fraternal twins. So this says, yes, there is a genetic component, right? But it also suggests it's not all genetic, right? If it was just genetic, then it'd be 100% concordance rate, right? If, for the identical twins, but that's, that's not the case. So there are other things that play into it as well. Another thing that we can do is adoption studies. So we'll look at the adoptees and the families of adopted parents. So uh, in one study, they looked at the biological parents of kids who were adopted out uh, and those adoptees had been hospitalized for depression. So they had severe depression and they found a higher incidence of severe depression in the biological parents of those kids, even though they'd never lived with those parents, right? Or at least very minimal. Um, so they then looked at a control group and found, you know, not the same rate of depression. And so it wasn't just, you gave your kid up, so you have depression, right? Uh, another study found that depression occurred seven times more often in the biological relatives of severely depressed adoptees than in the biological relatives of non-depressed control adoptees. So again, high suggestion there's a biological component because here you don't have a shared environment at all, right? And you still see this concordance. Then what we've really been doing, well, not me personally, but psychologists in general and medical doctors, medical researchers in general, have been doing molecular biology, uh, gene sequencing studies. So um, depressed people, they find, have the abnormality of a 5-HTT gene, um, which is responsible for the brain making serotonin or 5-HT, which is one of the neurotransmitters we know is related to depression. However, that one gene is never going to be the full explanation for depression. It's going to be a lot more complex because we know that, you know, even something like eye color or like coat color in cats is more complex than that, right? So we know it's not going to be one gene. It'll probably be several different genes. Um, and, you know, this study was done, I think, around... 2000, 2004. So, you know, they may have found more genes related to depression since then. Actually, I'd be shocked if they hadn't. Alrighty, so I am going to stop there for today. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you all for asking your questions. And um, I'll stick around for a couple minutes in case anyone has any questions. And I will see you on Thursday and we'll keep talking about uh, depression. I am guessing I will not have your exams graded by Thursday, uh, but I will probably try to grade them on Friday because the meeting I was gonna have got canceled. So I know I'll have some time. All right, take care of yourselves and I will see you in a couple of days.